2022 Beyond the Basics. My name is Jesse Bumgarner, Marketing Coordinator at ELK, and our presenter today is Amy Strickland in Tech Support. Before we, we begin, I want to remind all of you that ELK will be at ESX in Nashville June 19th and 20th, booth 241. For more information, please visit our website, www.elkproducts.com. I also want to let you all know that we are on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, so follow us for all the ELK updates. If you have any questions during the webinar, to the right of your screen, you can type in your question in the text box. We will get to as many questions as we can during the webinar. We'll uh, answer some questions while Amy's presenting, and then we'll also have a Q&A at the end. Uh, and also, we will be recording this webinar and expect a follow-up email early next week. Uh, we'll send you a link to the recorded webinar along with other helpful resources. So I would like to now introduce to you Amy Strickland. Thank you, Jesse, for that lovely introduction. And I want to thank everyone for being with us here today. We're going to go over some um, things in the ELK RP software and, and show you some things about the M1 that we just don't get around to covering in our basics class. So we're just going to dive in just a little bit deeper. Um, so what I'd like to do at this point is just uh, go ahead and jump right into ELK RP. Um, so I want to start by talking about some account and database management. Um, this is just going to go over some ways that you can organize your accounts and, and that kind of thing so that you can uh, you know, keep things organized. If you have a lot of accounts, just having a big list of them is not necessarily easy to um, work with. So I'm going to show you some, some tricks um, on that. So on the screen here, you can see I have a few different folders. I've got a business accounts folder. And if I click on my tree view here on the folder items, you can see how I've got this uh, you know, kind of organized. I've got a business accounts. And with it, within that, I have restaurants, you know, residential accounts. And within that, I have uh, Cherry Grove. Maybe that's a, you know, a, a sub-development, that kind of thing. Um, so let's just take a look at how we can get our accounts into these kind of folders. Um, I want to start by looking here at our, our Main Street Bistro. That is a, an account that we should probably have in our restaurants folder. So I'm just going to double click on that account to open it. And you can see here on the account details screen, we have a place here for a folder. Now you can just start typing stuff in here and that's the, the best way to start a new folder. There's also a browse button here. Since we're wanting to put this in a folder that already, already exists, we can browse to our business accounts and then click on restaurants. And you'll see here it places a period between the business accounts and restaurants, that's how you would um, you know, create a subfolder if you were starting a new subfolder. But once we've selected the folder that we want to put it in there, we just save that. And as we go back to our list, now you'll see that that is going to be under our business accounts and restaurants. So we've, we've got that organized a little bit better there. Um, You'll see here I have uh, you know, the Wise Convenience Store, the Wise Family, and Wise Sporting Goods. Maybe we have a, a, you know, a family here on the, on a few businesses, and we have a lot of uh, accounts with them. So I'm just going to use this as an, as an example to show you how to create a folder that doesn't exist. Um, we don't really want to, because this is a customer we have a lot of different accounts with, we don't really want to just stick them in you know, residential and business. Maybe we want to create a special folder for this particular um, customer. So let's just open up one of these accounts. We'll open up the convenience store here. And so what I can do here is just start typing the name that I want for the folder um, that doesn't exist. And if I could type a little better, it would be helpful. So I'm going to name this folder Wise Accounts. And then just click Save. And now as I go back, you'll see I have a folder here called Wise Accounts, and that particular one went in it. So now I could apply these other accounts to that folder in the same way that I did the, the restaurants. You can see how easy it is to, to do this, and, and once you get it in place, it really helps to organize your accounts. So that's just a little trick for you there on putting accounts in folders. Another thing that you can do um, that you may not be aware of or, or maybe you haven't uh, tried it before, um, you can synchronize databases. 
This is good if you have you know, multiple technicians, they have the software installed on their computers, maybe you have a, a, a main computer back at the office where you keep all the accounts. Um, so in the file menu there is a synchronize option. And here you can um, select a master database and that would be, say, the one at the office. That's going to be the, the database that we currently have open as what's in the master database now. Then we can browse to a different database. So let's just pick, um, pick one at random here. I'll pick this one. And then click open. And this could be a database that's on a computer. It could be on a, a network drive, or, or maybe they, have the, they keep the database on some kind of removable media. You can browse to, to wherever you need to to find that. Um, once you select the databases that you want to compare, you can click the Analyze button. And LCARP will actually compare those two databases. And it's going to tell you two different things. It's going to let you know if there's an account that exists in one and not the other. And it's also going to tell you if there's any differences in the accounts. And it looks like I picked two that were the same. Let me, uh, let me find one that's definitely going to be different because I want you to be able to see what this is going to look like. So I'm just going to pick this one. All right, so there you can see um, we have a lot of accounts in the master database that aren't in the remote, some accounts that are in the remote database that aren't in the master database. Um, so these are, are accounts that exist in one and not the other on the top here. On the bottom part of the screen, it shows accounts that exist in both. You know, they have the same name, but there are some differences between the data that is in them. So it, it compares it to, to that level. So if your technician goes out and makes a change um, to one of your existing systems and then comes back, you can use this as a way to keep your database synchronized. So it's very convenient for you know, situations like that where you may have um, more than one database you know, that's, that's being used to manage your accounts. It's a good idea from time to time to back up your accounts database. And the best way to do that is really just to, to grab a copy of the accounts database file that you're using, your master copy. So um, I'm just going to, you know, you, you, you get to that through different uh, places depending on your operating system. Um, so if you're on a you know, Windows XP machine, um, which is what I'm using, then you can go into your, um, into my computer just drag this over here on the screen to your local disk C and you need to go into your documents and settings folder and then go to all users and application data. Now you can see here this application data folder is grayed out or you know it's, it, it's um, like kind of a faded looking folder compared to some of these other ones. That's because it is a hidden folder. Um, I have my computer currently set up to show me hidden folders and let me just quickly show you how to do that if you're not familiar with that. You go to Tools and Folder Options and you'll go to the View tab and you'll just want to make sure that this Show Hidden Files and Folders option is, is selected. And that may be in a different place in like Windows 7, um, Windows Vista, Windows 8. Um, they have that. Uh, you, you should be able to get to that through your um, control panel or through a similar menu like this. But you just want to make sure that you have that option for show hidden files and folders. So we'll go into application data and then there's an RP folder. And this is the folder that contains all the different files that RP uses um, to you know, save your accounts and your operators and that sort of thing. So you just want to back up these files and, and the main one that you worried about backing up as far as your accounts is concerned is this elkaccounts.mdb file that is a Microsoft Access Database file. Um, you want to save that. If you have operators set up on your computer, you may also want to um, back that file up as well. Um, but those are just the files that you're going to want to get to. Now if you're on a um, Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, that file structure, it's actually a little bit easier to navigate to where this is stored. Um, you're going to go into your local disk and you'll go to a program data folder. You'll also see program files, but that's not where you're going to see these files. You need to go into program data, which is a hidden file, so it's again important that you have that feature um, to show those enabled to be able to see that. And then you'll see an RP folder. Everything's pretty much the same from the RP folder, and you're going to see these types of files in here. Um, so that's in program data on those newer operating systems. 
And I just want to pause for a second here and see if anybody has any questions about these, uh, you know, account database management uh, tricks I've shown here. I do have some questions. Uh, is there an account name search? Yes. Here you, with your little binoculars, you can go to find and you'll see that you have all these different things that you can search for to find a particular account. It could be by the account name or the name that you've given it, which are two different things. I'll show you those here in just a second. Um, the account is like the ID that you put in when you create the account. The name is, you know, a name that you can associate with it. So you might have the ID number as being some kind of account number that you have for your bookkeeping or your central station even. Um, and then you could put the customer's name in the name field. But you can also search by address, city, state. You see all these different things that you can search by. So um, definitely different ways to find that. And you've even got a place here to choose the different system types. So that's how that works. So if I was to put in um, Y's here, for instance, let's just see what we find. Well, I'm not sure why that didn't work. It may be an exact match there. Let's try something here. So it looks like that does have to be an exact match. But that's how um, I you also would have, use. how how do you tell which version of an account is most recent? Now, this question may be related to doing the uh, comparison. Let's just go back to that for a second. So when you select these, like see, so you can select that and then you can view here. So I selected this typical elk and I'm viewing now that those two exist on the, you can see some different data here. So it's going to tell you like the install date, um, give you some basic information there to try to compare them. You'd be able to see if there was a difference in, in firmware and things like that. Um, so that's the, the best information that you're going to have as far as being able to tell which one's which. Now it, it's important to remember that you know if you're if you have this where you're doing the database comparison if your technician has been out to the job and made some changes then you're going to know that that remote database is the one that has the the current updates so there you know there's just some some things there that you have to keep in mind as far as what you're comparing um, you know, of course the uh, the field computer is going to have the information that they've been changing and your remote database is going to so you're in that case, going to want to transfer from the remote to the, the master. Hopefully that and answers then, that question. Yes. And then this is a two-part question. Can you name the two files that need to be backed up again? And also, um, using Windows XP, uh, this person's RP2 does not have the ELK account to .mdb. They only have it with MB. So is that the same? Um, and then also, what are the two files again that you need to back up? Okay, the, the most important file is the elk accounts 2mdb That's actually the file that stores all of the accounts. So all of the accounts that you have in elk RP are stored in that file. Um, now, you may see a file called elk accounts 2 that does not have a file extension. Again, that's all a matter of whether or not you're showing file extensions. Um, again, that, that option is here as to, you know, if you have this hide extensions for known file types, you can see now my MDB went away. So it's just called elk accounts 2. Um, there are the these other ones, underscore db, mdb.back, um, there's an, I think there's an LDB in here somewhere. There's, so there's some different names, but the one that you want is the elk accounts too, that is just the MDB file. And you may be seeing that on your computer like you're seeing it on mine now without that file extension listed. Now the other file that I was talking about backing up would be the ops2. .mdb, and you would only need to back that up if you have operators enabled on Elk RP, and that's actually what I'm getting ready to go into next is the operator, so um, let me just go ahead and dive right into that. You can go to the setup menu here and choose operators, and here you can enable multi-operator access, and what that allows you to do is to um, require a username and password when you log in to Elk RP, and then you can um, restrict what certain people can do. So that's the purpose behind that. Um, if you have operators set up, um, then 
you would want to maybe back up that operator's database periodically. But um, let's just take a look here at the supervisor account so that you can just get a quick view there of what you can do with that. Um, so you can see you can kind of restrict um, what a person can see, what they can edit, like you can make it where they can see the customer's uh, communicator setup, but maybe they can't edit it. Um, you might hide um, the anti-takeover settings from them, um, you know, being able to export or import accounts, just different things that you can restrict. And again, this is something that uh, a, a larger company with a lot of different technicians may find helpful to restrict certain things. And then once you've made a change here, you would want to, you know, save and exit. I don't want to enable that on my computer, so I'm going to exit without saving there. All right, so the next thing that I want to get into, and I'm just going to open up this uh, Clark family account under my residential accounts. And I want to take a, a few minutes here to talk about connection methods. There are three basic ways that you can connect to an M1 panel. You can either do a direct connection, um, which is connecting your computer directly to the serial port on the M1. Um, you may use a standard serial cable for that. It is just a th straight through connection. Or if your computer doesn't have a serial port, which is uh, be more common that they don't these days, um, you can use a USB to serial converter. Elk does offer one of those. It's a USB 232 is the part number, and that's one that we have uh, tested and confirmed will work with the M1. Other cables may work as well. Um, if you have one already, you're, you can go ahead and try that. Um, it works with most cables, but you know there's no guarantees that it will work with the cable that you have. Um, if it's not the one from Elk. So if you have one, go ahead and try it. It'll probably work, but we can't guarantee that it will work with every cable. Um, but once you have a cable like that installed, then you're going to need to make sure that ElkRP knows what COM port to go to. And so the best thing to do is go to the device manager on your computer. There are a couple of different ways to get there, and again, it varies based on your operating system. Um, but you can generally get to the device manager through the control panel. Um, going to system properties or in the newer operating systems, once you're in the control panel, you may see an option for device manager under your hardware listing. Um, the device manager um, basically in, in the operating systems looks the same. It looks something like what you see on the screen here now. And so when you have a USB serial cable or a COM port um, directly on your computer, it will be listed here under ports. You can see I have a USB serial hooked up here. And so you can see that I have that set to on COM4. That's what my computer assigned to it when I plugged it in. Um, so you, that's something that you want to make note of. You also just want to um, go into the properties, and I just double clicked on it to go into those properties, and look at the port settings. You want to make sure that the bits per second is 115,200. And then these other settings are standard, but you want to double check those. Data bits 8, parity 9, stop bits 1, flow control none. Um, but again, the main thing is knowing what COM port number it is and making sure the speed's set correct in the device manager. Once you've done that, then you can go here in the setup menu in LCRP and go to communications. And here you're going to have a drop-down menu that's going to list any available COM ports. COM4 is the only one available on my computer that's listed there. I'd want to make sure that it's selected. And then you can click OK. And once you've done that, then you can go to Connection here, and you'll see you have the option for direct using COM4. So that's what you would select if you're going to do a direct connection. Another method of connecting is through a modem. This is probably one of the um, least used connections, just because modems aren't, aren't quite as popular as, as they have been in the past. And it is a slower method of connecting. Um, but it is possible to do that. Uh, again, you would need to go here in the Setup menu. And under Communications, you're going to need to select the modem that you're using on your computer. Um, so it's important to make sure that the modem is properly installed, and again, that it is listed in your device manager. So you select the modem there. There's a configure button here that allows you to look at some of the settings. Those settings are only going to apply to LCRP, and that's what this little message is about. 
then you're going to see here you have um, these, these different settings for your modem. So modem connections are at 2400, so you, may, you want to adjust your port speed there to 2400. Um, these other options you can leave as is, um, but you may want to go in and, and change that port speed just to make sure that you're communicating at the right speed because that can cause some issues. Um, so once you've made that selection, um, and you've selected your modem, then you're going to see dial using, you'll have your modem name there, and you'll see that this one actually gives us a secondary drop down where we can see um, the different methods, fully automatic, prompt when answers, this is going to give you some dialogues on the screen that allow you to control when the M1 starts trying to communicate with, uh, with the modem. Um, dial hang up dial again, that allows you to dial in, let it ring once or twice, hang up, and then dial back, and it'll pick up on the first or second ring. Um, these other options are related to um, either the customer being on site um, or you being on site. These first two are the customers on site and they're going to go to a keypad menu and allow you to connect by initiating the connection from the keypad. They'll listen for the phone to ring and, and hit a particular menu on the keypad to, to allow the connection. The local via house line, um, that's, you know, you can plug into a, a wall outlet, you know, a, a phone jack in the home and, and connect over the local connection that way instead of having to be on a different phone line. But, um, probably the more common way to connect is going to be through the network. So you're going to do that through the M1 XCP setup here. And you'll just want to go into the M1 XCP setup, which is this button here in the lower um, right hand corner of the screen, and then click the find button. And it's going to go out on the network and look for M1 XCPs. There happen to be quite a few here where I am. Normally you're only going to see the one. So I'm going to select the one that's mine here and click use selected. Then I can close the M1 XCP setup and I'm going to go to the connection and then I, you can choose network. And I'm going to go ahead and, and connect using this method here. You can see it's telling me my firmware is different. That is normal to see that the first time you've connected to an account. So just click OK on that. Now if that message says something about wireless, you may want to pause and uh, you know, ask do I have wireless on this system? If so, what kind is it? That sort of thing because it may erase wireless data. So um, you see a different message that will very specifically say you know, the wireless, uh, the, this version supports a different version of wireless. Um, so use caution there. But you can see here I, I have a number of conflicts. Um, what LCRP does when you connect is it actually compares what's in the control with what's in the account that you've connected to and it's going to tell you everything that's different. So um, I'm not sure why that keeps happening, but we've got this uh, yellow window here down at the bottom and you can see it has all these different zones and things that are different from what I have in my Elk RP and what I have in my control right now. Um, so you can choose to send or receive these items. Um, you can select them and view differences and it will tell you what's different. See, zone 1 in my system is the front door. In this database account I have open, it's the master closet door, so um, you can decide whether or not you need to send or receive those things. Um, and that's For now, I'm just going to let that go. Um, and I want to show you the event log. Once you're connected, then you see you get a few more options up here with these buttons that were previously grayed out, one of which is the event log. Um, you can receive either the newest 20 events, which is what I'm going to do, or you can receive the entire log. And you see here I have some system startups. I've turned my system on and off a number of times today, um, doing some testing. I'm going to go ahead and receive the entire log. And you'll see here where you know different alarms have occurred, um, codes have been put in, that kind of thing. So this is just all of the events. Now from this screen, you can print the log. You can save it to file and you can clear it. Um, so if you save it to file, then this is going to come up with a, a, a save dialog and it's going to ask you where you want to save it, what you want to call it. And um, the default method for saving that is a comma separated values file, which is something that you can easily open in like Excel, that kind of thing. Um, you can have it also just be a text file if you wanted to, which would be a little bit harder to, to understand. The uh, comma separated values is going to give you a nice table view when you open that in Excel. Um, so that's 
how you can save it. You can also print it. And so if you click print here, it's going to just automatically print directly to your default printer. Now if you want to set up the printer, you would click here and this is where you would you know, pick which printer you want to send it to, that kind of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and close the log. And I want to briefly just touch here on cutoff timers. Um, get some questions about this in tech support. Cutoff timers are how the system knows how long a siren should go off for any particular kind of alarm. Um, so the default for most of the alarms is 600 seconds. You'll see that they're all set to 600 seconds here. The default value for fire is actually um, 65535. That's what you would see there in a default account. And that's basically just an infinite amount of time um, for the M1. It's actually, you know, the siren will just continue to go off until someone acknowledges the alarm. If you do the math on how long that is, it's like it, it ends up being like 18 hours or something like that. But still, it's uh, for the M1 that is infinite. Um, so this is how you would adjust the different cutoff timers. You just change the seconds here. What we find is that some, in some cases, a certain kind of alarm. Let's just say, for instance, a water alarm. You really don't want the siren to go off. You just want certain things to happen. Maybe notification. Maybe you're uh, controlling a water shutoff valve. That kind of thing. But you don't really want siren activation for that kind of alarm. In that case, you would want to set it to one second, not zero, but one. At one second, the siren will not go off. Um, if you set it to zero, you're going to find that things don't work the way that they're supposed to. So be cautious there. But any alarm that you don't want the siren going off, set it to one second. Otherwise, you can just adjust these for whatever amounts of time makes sense for you, or perhaps maybe there's ordinances in the neighborhood that you have to go through, that kind of thing. Hey, Amy. I have yes. a question backing up to event log. Is there a way to save the log into a system log, system log server? Not automatically. Um, now, the log data, as things are happening, that log data is getting pushed out the serial port on the M1. So if someone wanted to capture that data as it's coming out of the serial port and have that then somehow be, uh, you know, um, saved, um, parsed, and served, uh, you know, put, put on the server, um, you would have to, you know, have some kind of, because it's going to be raw data, you'd have to have some type of um, software there to interpret that data into, you know, what those events actually are. And that's all in our protocol document if that's something that you're interested in doing. But at this particular time, that piece of software to capture and save all that data doesn't exist um, as far as something that, that is available um, on the market for the M1. But the possibility is definitely there to do something like that. If, if someone's interested in doing that, they'll find uh, on our website the M1 RS-232 protocol. And so you can see you know, how that log data looks and, and how you interpret it as it's coming out of the serial port. All right, the next thing I want to look at here is um, just taking a, a look at some of these global items. We sort of hit on this a little bit in the basics, but I want to go a little bit more in depth on some of these global items that we don't get to in that basics course. Um, so let me just hop right into zones here. Um, this is where you have your loop response time. And um, let me just quickly hop over here to the zones page and show you where you have fast loop response. Um, so a zone that has fast loop response selected is going to follow the fast loop response time that you see here, which by default is 40 milliseconds. Any zone that does not have that box checked is going to follow the slow loop response response time, which is 400 milliseconds. You know, we're still talking about, you know, very fast reaction times on the system, uh, you know, talking milliseconds here, but uh, you can make adjustments there, and um, in some cases that helps with the particular sensor that maybe is more or less sensitive as you need to adjust the timing that the M1 responds to it. Um, an example of something that you have to have fast loop response time on is a zone temperature sensor an M1 ZTS or M1 ZTSR that is required on those types of zones. So that's where you can make adjustments to those times. You'll also see here we've got the cross zone verify time. If you have um, zones selected as a cross zone pool, 
zones, then they're going to have to be tripped within this time period in order to create an alarm. Um, and you also have that self-verify checkbox, which would mean that a, a one zone being tripped twice within that cross-zone verify time would create an alarm. And again, this applies to um, the zone option here in cross-zone pool. Now the other option that you see here is audible system troubles and again this is one that we talk about um, when we're doing uh, some tech support calls sometimes. Um, if you have a low battery, an AC failure, a phone fall, you know these different kinds of troubles on the system that cause the keypad to beep. Um, maybe that's not desirable uh, in some cases. You don't want the keypad to beep. You can come uncheck this box and that will prevent that keypad beeping from occurring. It doesn't suppress the event. Um, you're still going to see it displayed on the keypad. It's still going to be written to the log. It can still be reported. You know, all of those other things that you would want to happen, but you're not going to get the keypad beeps. And so, um, you know, if, that, if you're in a, a situation where maybe the um, phone line goes down periodically and you know don't want the keypad beeping or your customer just says I don't ever want this keypad to beep in the middle of the night and wake me up then you may want to go ahead and, and turn this audible system troubles off. I want to talk about common area. I just want to kind of give you a, a brief explanation of what this is. Um, if you have areas common to area one then area one can't be armed until its common areas are armed. If any of its common areas are disarmed, area one will automatically be disarmed. Now this does not imply any automatic arming of area one based on its common areas. That can be achieved through rules, and I can show you an example of that once we get into the rules section here in just a minute. Um, but that's, that's what common area is. This is how you set up which zones are common to area one, and um, that's what you would expect to happen when you do that. Now, you know, example of when you would want to do that, maybe you have um, two different businesses in the same building, um, and you have you know, one office set as um, area two, the other office set as area three, and then area one is the common lobby or vestibule that those two businesses share, and you know, that's, a, that's an example of where you might use that. On the Output 1 tab, this contains the volume controls for Output 1. And so you'll see here in this example they're all set to 1. But um, you may want to have, like, say, your maximum siren alarm. Maybe you want that to be as loud as it can be, and, and that's going to be 7. Um, maybe you want your voice also somewhere in that neighborhood. Let's just say you want the voice at 5. So if you have this volume upon initial alarm set lower, than the maximum volume levels, then that's going to activate a, a feature we call volume step. It's going to start out at that lower level and gradually increase over a 90 second period to the maximum level. So it's kind of a you know, peacekeeper type of feature so that you're not automatically going into that full volume. It does give you some time to, you know, if it's a false alarm situation, it's been accidentally tripped, your customer has time to get to the keypad and turn it off before it's at full volume. So it's a nice feature that a lot of people like. On the voice tab here, we're looking at just options where you can enable and disable different categories of the voice. So maybe you never want voice chime messages, you can turn that off. Uh, maybe you don't really want um, you know, system messages, you can turn those off. You can completely disable the voice altogether here with this checkbox. Um, so that's, that's what you're going to see there is the different categories of the voice. And then on the Output 2 tab, by default Output 2 is set up to play sounds, a siren sounds, through a speaker. This is the siren output mode. It uses the onboard siren driver. If you have a self-contained siren or you want to use a different kind of siren driver, um, you can set it to voltage and you're going to get a voltage trigger out on output 2. So that's where you would make that change just depending on what you're using. You can also set a delay on output 2. Typically output 2 is the outside siren, so if you want there to be a delay before it goes off, again kind of a peacekeeper, um, you don't want to alert the neighbors if, if maybe it's been an accidental um, alarm there, it's been accidentally tripped, gives the customer some time to get to the keypad and turn it off before it starts blaring the outside siren. You've also got this single alarm lockout. 
And so that just means within a one arm cycle, output two is only going to go off one time. If you have another alarm, output one would still go off, but output two would not if you have that enabled. And you know, this is the default setting that you see on the screen for the delay and the lockout to be disabled, and again, using the onboard siren driver. Now we want to go into the special tab here. Um, we've got two-way callback time versus the central station verify call time. You've got these two different settings here. And this is a point of confusion for some folks as to what, uh, what those are and when to use one, when to use the other, or should they both be used. Um, if you have two-way listening, and you're going to have this two-way listening box checked, as you see here on the screen, and you're going to want to use the two-way callback time feature. That is going to set the amount of time that the central station has to initiate the two-way listening session and also to reinitiate it once they've hung up. They would have that much time to try to reinitiate the session as well. So if you have two-way listening, you use that. If you do not have two-way listening on the system, that's where the CS verify call time comes into play. You would set that to a certain value and that's going to, when there's an alarm, it's going to transmit that alarm to the central station. This is going to hold additional alarms for this amount of time, freeing up the phone line where the central station could then call in and try to verify the alarm uh, manually over the phone. So that's the difference between those two. We get some confusion about that. Um, a feature that's uh, you know, been in the system for a while, but it is one of our newer features, um, is the telephone line fault timer. You can now set how long the telephone line has to be down before the M1 recognizes that as a trouble. Um, you know, again, it's been, been there for a little while, but it is a, something newer, so some of you may not be aware of that. You can set that to a higher number, and again, that kind of goes back to an example I was talking about just a moment ago where you could um, maybe possibly have a, a situation where the phone line just goes down for just a little bit of time and then comes back up and maybe that's a regular occurrence. I've talked to people that have run into that. So you can adjust this so that the system doesn't act on those brief outages. You've got an option here for the serial port zero baud rate. What you see there is the default and that's um, good for just about anything that you're going to do with it. But if you do need to make changes to that, you do have some other, you know, slower um, communication speed options. You also see here um, the checkbox options for what gets transmitted out the serial port. Um, we spent some time just a moment ago talking about the event log. Here is where you would determine whether or not all that log data gets pushed out the serial port as things are happening. Um, you just, you know, this is where you're going to have those options, and these options apply to any kind of third-party. Um, application, whether it be like a smartphone app or maybe it's a you know, high-end uh, system like maybe your, your Crestrons, your AMXs, things like that, um, that are integrating in with the system. This determines what data gets sent out to those types of things. You also find here your keypad programming lockout. This is where you can lock out the ability to make programming changes at the keypad. Now, um, at zero, you, you would be able to view and change everything. Um, I'll just drop this down here where you can see the different options that you do have. Um, you can make it where telephone options um, can't be changed. Um, you can make it where no options can be changed, but they can be viewed. Or you can make it where you can't get into keypad programming at, at all. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. If you do not want keypad programming, you can disable it here. Just use caution with that because you know once you made the change here, you can't change that back through the keypad. It has to be changed through the software. So just something to be aware of there. I know we're trying to cram a lot of information here in this hour. I do want to pause briefly just to see if there are any questions, but we want to kind of keep things moving because I have you know, a few more things I want to show you here. Amy, I do have a question. Can you mute audible trouble per keypad, or is it system-wide? That is a global system option, so it's not per keypad. It, it is for the entire system. Um, so if you are looking at, there are certain things that you can mute per keypad, but that's going to be like your um, entry tones and your exit tones, you, just things like that. But as far as like these trouble conditions, it's global. Thank you. I want to hop down here now into the automation section. 
and just kind of go through some of this stuff with you. We're going to um, you breeze through some of this because there's just not a lot to it, like tasks for instance. Here's where you're going to name the task, determine whether or not it can be shown on a user interface, and give it a voice description if you want to. The purpose of the voice description would be for the telephone remote control feature. If you click in the voice description box, then you'll see these different drop down boxes and you know if I wanted to call that uh, thermostat and then um, you can you know name it uh, thermostat task or something like that whatever you want to have on the telephone remote control um, if you're not using the telephone remote control then there's really no point in putting in the voice descriptions but again naming and showing are the main things that you're doing here and it's sending all the tasks now so I'm actually just going to go ahead and disconnect so that, that doesn't keep happening because it's slowing us down a little bit um, okay so on the lighting screen here's where you can name your lights choose the format with most of the things that we're using it's going to be serial expander really the only exception to that is like your standard all of these extended those things re relate to X10 which is you know just not very commonly used anymore so you're pretty much gonna see serial expander for your lighting on just about everything then you can choose whether or not it's a dimmer or an on off you know that kind of thing um, so you can manually put this stuff in again choosing whether or not to show it you've got a place for a voice description um, with a lot of the different lighting options that we have, you can import the lighting data. And you do that by right-clicking on lighting and choosing import lighting data. Here you're going to have a place to pick what kind of lighting data you're importing, browsing to the file, and then just setting some other options. And we have um, different, uh, where we've done different webinars on different kinds of lighting that we work with. And you'll find those on our website. So if there's, you want to know specifically about you know, Lutron or UPB, then um, go seek out those uh, webinar videos that you'll find on our website. And we'll give you all the specific details that you need for that. Outputs, again, you're naming and you're showing and you can set a voice description. That's all that you're doing there. The outputs are actually controlled through rules. Um, sunrise and sunset, we, we hit on this briefly in the, the basic training. There's just not a lot to tell here. You, s you either put in the coordinates, maybe you get that from your GPS, or you can select a city. Here we're you know, very close to Hickory, so we're just going to use those settings. Once you enter that information, you're going to click the Calculate button, and that's going to give you your sunrise and sunset time so that you can use those in rules. Under the Voice section here, um, I'm going to take you here to system miscellaneous. This is a good example. Um, you can put in different miscellaneous messages that maybe you don't have associated with something else. Um, so this is where you can just make up your own messages. Like if you maybe want to have a reminder um, to do a particular task or whatever, you might put that in here. Um, you can see here someone's put in rear door open, please close door in as a miscellaneous one. I say someone, that must have been me. <laughs> um, but this is just where you can do that. Now you can also customize some of the voice messages that the system uses here. Um, so let's just uh, take a look at zone types, for, for instance. Uh, this is one of the more common things that you see. Um, when you have a, an open zone on the keypad, you press your up arrow key to see what it is. It says like intrusion, violated, and then the zone definition. If you don't want to hear the word intrusion, you can come here and blank it out. And so this is just an example of how you can really customize the voice just by, you know, I don't want to hear that particular message, you can blank it out, or you can change what these say if you want to. So that's what this section is all about. Now, Custom settings. Um, this is one of the, I, I think, uh, you know, nicer features of the system that maybe doesn't get used as often um, because I, you know people maybe don't understand it or they're just not sure how to use it. Um, what this is is a way for you to build variables into your rules. Um, so you can see here I've got some economy comfort things for thermostats that are numbers. Um, I've got a timer for a closet light, and I've got some time of day settings for when I want to turn the voice on and off. And so you set those here as far as to what they are and the initial values and then you can use those in your rules. And I'll show you some rules examples here real quick uh, in just a minute. Um, I wanted to um, 
very briefly here, uh, I would like to show you on the keypad, and so uh, I've got my webcam up on the screen here. And for those of you, um, I, this is our first time using a webcam, so if you can, if you do not see it, please raise your hand in your control panel, and uh, we'll na we'll uh, take note of that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to show you here real quick. Um, uh, this is the Navigator keypad, and I'm going to go into the menu here, and I'm going to go to Automation, and Automation Custom Settings. It's going to want me to put in a code. I'm just going to key in the installer code here real quick, but a master user code would work. This is a user level menu. And so now you can see here my heat economy mode and that it's currently set to 68. Um, so I can change that if I wanted to make that 72, then I could change that. And, and that's how your customer would make changes to these variables that you build into the rules. All right, counters, again, that's just something that you're naming here. Thermostats, also just something that you're naming. And I realize that we're running uh, short on time here, but I want to get through some rules examples here. And, and so for the um, purpose of, of trying to save time, I've already have quite a few set up here, and I'd just like to go through and kind of explain some of these to you. Um, so I was talking about common areas before, and so my examples one and two here, um, these two rules are related to that common area. So um, if I want to automatically arm area one when area two and three are armed, I'm going to have to set up two rules to do that. So here I have in rule one, whenever area two is armed and area three, excuse me, armed away, and area three is armed away, then I'm going to arm area one to away. Um, now I have to write a second rule because the whenever and the and are not the same thing. You know, they're, the whenever is the trigger and the and is a condition that must be met at the time the trigger occurs. So you can't know which order area two and area three are going to get armed in. You know, area three might get armed first or area two might get armed first. So that's why you have to have rule number two to account for the other possibility that, um, you know, when area three is armed, the area two is already armed away then you're arming area one. So you've got to keep in mind that, that you have to account for those different um, scenarios when you're doing those kind of rules. But that's an example of how you could auto arm your common areas. My examples three and four here are related to turning the voice and you'll see here in the rule it says disable non-alarm voice messages, and that means just what it says. It's going to disable only non-alarm messages. So if there is an alarm, any voice messages that apply to that alarm will be heard even when this is um, disabled, the non-alarm is disabled. Um, so you can see here I've put in this custom setting 7, and let me just dive into this rule here and, and um, this particular part of it. So this is um, when you go to whenever and you choose um, time of day. You can either set a specific time of day, which I'm sure you've seen us do in a number of examples, or you can choose at a custom setting time. So that's where you can make use of those custom settings. Maybe your customer might want to change what time that occurs later on down the road. You build in this variable. They don't have to call you out to make a programming change. They can make that change themselves. So you're giving them some flexibility, which you know is, is always appreciated. So we've got a custom setting for when it turns off and a custom setting for when it turns on. Maybe your customer wants to have manual control of that as well through an F key. And so that's what you're going to see here in my rule examples 5, 6, and 7. So we're, when the F5 key on any keypad is pressed, then we're toggling an output. We're choosing a phantom output here, and what I mean by that is it's an output that does not physically exist. It's not physically connected to or controlling anything. We're just using it as a way to follow a state. In this case, it's kind of like a flag. So we're going to toggle that with each F key press. When that output is in the turn to the on state, then the voice gets disabled. And when the output is turned to the off state, the voice gets re-enabled. So this gives your customer manual control over the non-alarm voice using the F5 key.
Examples 8 and 9 are related to thermostat control and also using tasks. Tasks are um, useful when you want to activate a particular sequence from a user interface um, or from an F key or um, you want to have that happen automatically but it's just always this sequence that you want so that you don't have to keep writing that rule over and over again, you know, then do these same things. You can set it up as a task define what happens the one time in the task and then you can call up the task when with these different things occur maybe in another rule through your user interface through an F key that kind of thing so these particular tasks are related to thermostats as I said and you can also see here I've incorporated those custom settings into these so that you, those, those set points can be changed just like I showed you on the on the webcam a moment ago um, again giving your customer that flexibility to say okay well you know 68 is not where I really want it let me make a change here and you don't have to keep coming out and making programming changes or you know remotely connecting and making programming changes you know, you're gonna look like a hero to your customer doing this because it's like you've just built in that flexibility for them they're really gonna appreciate that all right in my rule number 10 here we're looking at a closet door. Our zone one here is a closet door and we want to turn a light on for a certain amount of time when that closet door becomes not secure. Um, the idea here is you know you open the closet door, the light automatically comes on. That's great. But the better part is that the closet light is going to turn itself off. You're not going to have to remember to do that. I don't know um, how many folks out there have trouble with that, but that seems to be one of the things I struggle with is to remember to turn the closet light off. My husband's constantly fussing at me for that. So um, this is a way that you can kind of automate that. It's going to be nice because as soon as you open the door it comes on, but then you don't have to remember to turn it off. And again, there's another custom setting um, that I've used to determine how long that closet lot should stay on. All right. Looking at this next example here, we're making an announcement to remind someone that a door has been left open. So when this rear door is tripped, we're turning on this output 65 for five minutes. So when that output turns off, if that door is still open, it's going to make an announcement. And this ties into that miscellaneous one announcement that we were looking at where we had made a, a, a custom message that we wanted to have repeated here. Um, so it's going to make that announcement and then what happens is it turns that same output 65 back on. And again in this example output 65 is being used as a phantom output. It's not really controlling anything. We're just using it as kind of like a timer here. Um, so we turn that back on for 30 seconds. That causes this rule number 12 to loop. Um, so 30 seconds after this rule is initially triggered, it gets triggered again the door still open, it makes the announcement again and resets the 30 second timer. So it's just going to keep looking here as long as that output gets turned on um, for 30 seconds and then back off, you know, it's going to trigger this rule again, door remains open, it's going to keep repeating the message. As soon as somebody goes and closes that door, it stops the sequence and the rules are basically, you know, just reset waiting for the next time that that door gets left open. Um, so that's kind of an example there of how you can use an output to create like a, a, a looping sequence to keep checking something that you want to maybe have a repeated message or maybe you want to have repeated notification of something. Maybe you want it to send you an email or make a phone call if it's a temperature issue or something like that. So these are just things to kind of keep in mind as you're working with the M1. It does so much and it's important to, to try to help you understand how to make it do those things. That's why we try to do these webinars for you. Okay, now here is an example of using an attic fan and this uses a counter. So what we're doing here in these rules, we're checking the, every five minutes we're checking the outside temperature. So we have a zone temperature sensor that's giving us the outside temperature. We're actually going to set a counter to the value of the outside temperature. We're then turning on a phantom output for two seconds and the purpose of that in this case is just to make sure that everything happens exactly in the order that we want it to. 
So we're turning that output on for two seconds. After it turns off, then rule 14 gets triggered, and what we're doing is adding 15 to that same counter. So what we've done is set it to the outside temperature, and then two seconds later we're adding 15 to that. So what that gives us in that counter is a value that is um, 15 degrees above the outside temperature. So in rule 15, which we're checking every 20 minutes, we're looking to see if the attic temperature, which is a separate temperature sensor, is greater than our counter, which is the outside temperature plus 15 degrees. We turn the attic fan on. So um, that's a way that you can use counters to kind of um, you know, track something like a temperature. And then you can use that to turn on a fan, for example. This is a, a really interesting example that I went through with a customer one day. We figured out how to make this work, and it's really kind of a neat thing. All right, rule number 16 here is one that's going to give us a reminder. So what I've done, I'm just going to hop right over here to text really quick and show you what I've done here is set up a text that says replace water filter today. And if you wonder why it has that big space in it, I'll just double click on it there and show you. Um, if I take the space out, then my F ends up inside of water. So you've got these two boxes down at the bottom to kind of show you how it's going to scroll across the keypad so that you can make those adjustments that, that you need to, to to get it to look right. So set that up under text, and then in my rule 16, at 6 p.m. on the 12th day of every month, it's going to display this on the keypad. Now you could also have it beep the keypad if you want to draw more attention to it. It's going to display that there as long as, um, you know, at that time until somebody actually goes and presses the star key to acknowledge that they've seen it. Um, so, you know, the idea here at 6 p.m., if this is at my home, that's, you know, I'm getting home about then. I come in and I disarm my system. I'm going to be interacting with the keypad, so I'm going to see this message to remind me to change my water filter. You could use that for changing, um, you know, HVAC filters, reminders to change batteries. Um, you know, you can dive into this more. Like you, you know, I've got here the day of the month is 12. If you wanted to dive into that a little bit more, you could actually define that further and say, you know, it's a specific month of the year. That's how you could get a specific date. Um, and you can also, you know, set that to later months or earlier months, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, you know, it's pretty neat there as far as what you can do with that. All right, the last example I'm going to go over here and then we'll uh, have just a minute or two to go through questions is um, just sending text out of a port. So this example shows um, commands that are specifically for, in this case, Z-Wave locks. Um, we have to send a, a text string out a serial port to control a Z-Wave lock. Um, so you can see I'm sending that out port 1. That will correspond with the address of the Z-Wave interface. So again, you set the text up on the text screen that I was showing you before. Um, you find the, how those text strings need to be set up in the documentation for whatever you're controlling. And um, in this case, we're actually not sending the text out, but we're controlling something when it's being received. So we're manipulating an output on the system based on receiving whether or not the lock ha is in the lock or the unlocked position. So um, we can trigger on that string coming in through that port and tell the output to turn on or to turn off. And that's something that you'll find very useful when you're interfacing with different uh, serial devices. Now, I, I know that was a lot of information, and we had tried to cram a lot into that hour. We do have a, a minute or two here to try to address some questions. So, um, Jesse, what do you got? Um, are, th are these sample rules available on our website, or can our attendees get a copy of them? I've had a couple people ask uh, for these sample rules. I will certainly include that in the follow-up email, um, but I would also like to point you to some other online resources. Um, we have under the support section of our website, you'll find a section called Application Notes, and there we have a number of different examples of applications and the rules that you would need to write for those applications, so you'll find um, quite a bit of this stuff there. I would also um, direct you to our YouTube channel, Elk Products Video, where you'll find a video um, of a webinar that we did specifically on rules 
rule writing. So we spent you know an entire hour just on writing rules and go through um, some of these examples as well as some other examples and you know explain how to write those rules for you as well. So um, you can you know get the uh, application notes if you just want to see something or if you want to dive into rule writing a little bit deeper. I would recommend watching that video. Alrighty, and I know that we're about done, and so I, if you do have questions, please, uh, you can still keep them coming, and I'll collect them, and we can answer them right after the webinar. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys that we will be at ESX in Nashville, June 19th and 20th, so if you're there, please come by booth 241 and see us. I'll be here, and then we might have Amy remotely there. Um, and then we also have webinars uh, twice a month, so just keep uh, coming to our website to be notified about those. And then we're on social media. So I just want to say thank you so much for everyone attending and participating, asking questions. And we will just look forward to our follow-up email next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend.